Many thanks for joining us. My name is Felicity Ezewike. Yesterday, October 10, was World Mental Health Day, and it is essentially to rally action towards addressing mental health issues. Our conversation today, as an Africa-centric channel, focuses on how the continent is rising to the challenge posed by what WHO Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Machitiso Mweti, describes as Africa's large and growing burden of mental health conditions with children and adolescents worst impacted. There is more. Across the continent, an estimated 116 million people, according to the WHO, were already living with mental health conditions before the COVID-19 pandemic. Besides the weak mental health system, it says Africa has an average of 1.6 mental health workers per 100,000 population compared to 13 mental health workers per 100,000 at the global level. Over 70%, 70%, I beg your pardon, of the mental health workforce being referenced here are mental health nurses. But it is not all gloom. In August, African health ministers in the WHO Regional Committee endorsed a new strategy to reinforce mental health care and set 2023 2030 targets. Also, African governments have made some progress on mental health spending, which has risen to 46 US cents per person, even though it is still well below the recommended $2 per person. There are other commendable efforts as well across board. One of such is the Lagos State Mental Health Project in Nigeria. My guest today is the coordinator of this project, Dr. Tolu Ajomali. He is a public health, public mental health physician with training in global mental health, international health management, health programming, and data analytics. He has developed and facilitated a number of mental health programs and services for the Lagos State Government, including the Mental Health Better Access Project, Matano Mental Health Program, the Lagos Lifeline, and that's the state's technology-driven mental health counseling and psychosocial support services. And then we also have the Lagos Mind, a mainstream and digital mental health campaign and advocacy strategy. He was also a member of the committee for the establishment of the Lagos State Mental Health Law. Dr. Ajomale is an alumnus of Imperial College London. He will be joining us in a bit after we watch this very short report from Adeshawa Odushoga of New Central. Chained, beaten and often abandoned or left to roam the streets and highways. This is the story of an average mentally unwell person in Africa. It is quick to assume that a person is mad or more appropriate to say the person has gone insane and more commonplace to see people in tattered clothes muttering words that are most times not understood amid disjointed laughter. The World Health Organization described mental illness as a mental disorder characterized by a clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation or behavior. Mental illness remains underreported, especially in the rural community, which often believes you have to be a little dramatic and do things out of place before you can be believed to be mentally unwell. Dr. Kunle Kwelimo, a mental health strategist, unraveled some of this ambiguity and while mental illness receives such treatment in this part of the world. The ignorance of people is one of the reasons why we are having this stigmatization about mental health and that's why it's very, very important to keep creating conversations about mental health around the world, to normalize making mental health um, something you are proud of. I mean, to talk about your mental health, something you're proud of in one way or the other, just like we prioritize talking about physical health, which is comprised of a diet and exercise. A recent report shows that Nigeria, Africa's largest population, has millions of people living with mental illness which translate to almost one-third of the population. In this case, they are presumed to act normal but mentally unwell. But what may be contributing to a high number of mental illness in the continent? We have not designed an organized approach 
to solving mental health related issues, creating policies that will help people as regards their mental health. How about the budget for mental health in the overall budget for health? I think as it stands now, it's between the between three to five percent. Traditional beliefs and stigmatization have stopped people living with mental illness from seeking help, and in some cases, a patient may even be unaware, forcing an undiagnosed mental illness to become severe. Stakeholders believe there is a need for increased mental health awareness and advocacy against stigmatization by relevant authorities to have a mentally healthy population in Africa and beyond. Adesha Waldushoga reporting for News Central. That is some perspective on mental health as it stands. Unfortunately, it's still very poor. People still think there is some hereditary factor. Um, maybe the person who is mentally ill brought it on themselves. Well, we will have uh, Dr. Tulu Adjomale uh, speaking to us via telephone. Hopefully, he will be in the studio uh, in no time. Uh, but first, let me say thank you to Adesha Waldushoga for that very um, um, in-depth report. Um, Dr. Ajomale, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's begin by establishing what mental health is and why it is so important for Africa to pay attention. Right. So when we have conversations around mental health, uh, there are three things that I usually would use to properly put it in context. First is the health component in that definition. We know that by WHO's um, standardized definition of health, that is the state of uh, well-being that speaks to physical, mental, and social well-being of an individual and not just the absence of disease. So there are three components to health. There is physical health, there is mental health, and then there is social health. For us to begin to explore the conversations around mental health, we then begin to look at the definition itself of what mental health is. And standardized definitions have put in context what it is to begin to explain that it is the capacity for an individual to achieve he or her, you know, potential in life and to be able to contribute meaningly to the society. So by its definition itself, you understand that the context or definition of what mental health is is not about, you know, not being sick or not hearing voices or not or having irrational thoughts is about a person's capacity to be able to achieve their life's potential. And so we are exploring what are the things that can keep one from achieving those things. We've had conversations with experts and with people who find that a lot of times people with physical illness have a component of mental illness as well. And people who have optimal mental health tend to recover from physical illnesses quicker. So that puts in context for everyone to understand that conversations around mental health become more important today than it has ever been before because it has a huge role to play in our daily life. In the Africa wide, you, you said, uh, if I got you correctly, capacity to achieve life potential. So how does um, getting it right impact Africa's development? So, right, so now we, that potential has different expressions. You know, it can be very subjective as well. There is no standard definition of what, you know, achieving your potential in life is. It is up to each individual to be able to recognize what he or her potential in life is and be able to achieve them. And so, you know. Um, I think the network has cut us off. Um, uh, doctor, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. The, the line went off for a bit. Things that can affect one's mental health, right? Environmental factors that can affect one's mental health. So, for example, you know, if you are a person who lives in an area where there is conflict or there is, you know, or they're internally displaced or people who live in war-torn areas, it has you know, it's logical to come to the conclusion that that will have an impact on their capacity to achieve their life's potential and contribute meaningly to their, meaningly to their community. 
Also, someone who has lost a loved one or a mother who has lost a new baby will also not be able to contribute meaningfully to her community at that time because of grief, right? So those are the internal factors that we are exploring as things that can inhibit a person from achieving their potential in life and not necessarily external things, you know, that exist that keeps that person from achieving uh, those potentials. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking this question so we can truly establish, because some people think when we talk about mental health, maybe we're exaggerating. So I want you to speak to um, the question around, let me rephrase that. How true is it that attaining sustainable development goals related to uh, poverty, uh, malaria, HIV, gender empowerment, and education will be very difficult, if not impossible, if we fail to address mental health. What is the connection here? So the, con the connection is as diverse as the issues are. So, for example, um, dealing with poverty has a huge impact on one's mental health and mental well-being. Dealing, uh, uh, let, me, let me put it in a different context now. So you have two individuals, one who lives in an environment that, you know, um, they're probably educated and they have a job. Their capacity to deliver in their community is very different from someone who doesn't. However, we also know that just having a job alone or having been economically viable or, or socioeconomically, you know, not vulnerable can still expose you to issues that will begin to make you question your existence or your, you know, your ability to continue to live, right? So... The question around the issues that are impact mental health are very diverse. Some people, we, we've had conversations with people who would say that um, they saw someone yesterday who is probably a boss, who has a really decent house, has a good family, and then the next day they hear that the person ended their lives by suicide. That has a huge implication on, 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 on what that means for that person. It means that they've probably been struggling with issues that they've been able to mask over time and been unable to be able to unburden or express those issues. And, and those things have an impact on not just that person, but on their families as well, and of course on the entire community. So it, it's as diverse as the expression itself. I mean, for, for some, they would begin to explore conversations. I, I'm not sure if you're probably aware of this. Um, very recently, a very well-known celebrity in the U.S. launched a website to create resources for black people to have access to professional support because there is an understanding that they're vulnerable to certain risk factors because of their race or because of the color of their skin. And so they needed extra support to be able to allow them to explore their own potential in life. So different communities have different issues that would impact their ability to thrive. And I think the word there, the critical word there is the ability of a person to thrive. And by that extension, we begin to explore conversations around resilience, because resilience in itself also impacts the person's mental capacity or mental well-being. So to be clear, there is um, uh, a connection, there is a tie between attaining SDGs and addressing mental health in Africa. Sorry, can you, can you repeat that, please? I'm, I'm saying, there, you, to be clear, I want you to be clear that there is a strong connection between our success with attaining SDGs and how we manage mental health in Africa. There's a very strong connection. And I think the SDGs have provided mental health champions and advocates begin to also raise that conversation that, you know, beyond you know, health for all, which is one of the hallmarks of the Sustainable Development Goals, that there are several other components of Sustainable Development Goals that have a strong correlation and impact or strong correlation with mental well-being. Okay, what is the current state of recognition and support for mental, not just mental now, as psychosocial health in Africa? Right, that, the question is... I'm, I'm asking the connection and the support, rather, and the recognition that's given to mental health in Africa. What's the current status? Now, we have seen that low- and middle-income countries, like um, countries that exist in Africa, have a huge 
you know, gap in terms of availability of service. But the gaps themselves are as diverse as the countries in which they present. So, for example, some countries in Southern Africa have better resources than countries in, you know, Western Africa and Eastern Africa. And even within our country, Nigeria, there are certain regions of the country that have more access to services than others. Okay, I think we lost the call. We'll go on a short break, and when we come back, the conversation continues. Please don't go away. Good to know you're still with us. I have in the studio now Dr. Tolu Ajamali. Thank you very much for Thank making you. it. <laughs> okay, um, before the line went off, I was asking you about the current state of recognition for mental health and the kind of support that is available in Africa. Right, so in terms of recognition, it's, it's, it's a little, it's an interesting question that you've asked and it's a conversation that we've been having for several months now. Before now, the conversations around recognition had always been very biased, right? So there are two major issues that we have currently in Africa. There is a service gap, which means those who require service and then how much of that service available for them to be able to get access to. But there's also a knowledge gap, which is a level of awareness of the community members of the existence of different kinds of mental illnesses that can exist and knowing what to do when they recognize it. Before now, we've been very accustomed to using non-African approach to you know, issues around mental health, right? So we would use terms like loneliness because in certain climates, that is a very common issue to deal with. But you know, as, as, as Africa urbanizes, we know that those issues are also present here. But we have people who have been strongly with that, struggling with anxiety. They didn't recognize it as anxiety, right? And the conversations we've been having with a lot of experts, especially those who are into communi communications, are how do we express the same messages in the language that the people would understand? We've gone beyond the point where we can just begin to express in simple English you know, to certain people who are probably literate or educated, but we need to begin to also explore how to convert the language into local dialects that people can easily relate with. We have two kinds of people that essentially meet when, when we're talking about people who are accessing service, right, and seeking for support. We have those who recognize that there's something called depression or anxiety, and so they go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Some don't even know the difference. <laughs> which, which is another problem in itself, right? <laughs> yeah. But then we also have the other set of people who are struggling with the same things. They don't call it anxiety. They don't call it depression, even though they recognize the same symptoms that they're all dealing with. And so they will go and see their religious leaders or they go see traditional leaders or, or you know, healers to provide interventions for them when they could have easily gotten care from you know, professional experts who have been trained to, be, to provide that level of assistance. So we are in that paradigm shift now, and I think COVID also provided an opportunity for that. That, that was going to be my next question. But before we get there, you, you talked about knowledge and service a gap. Is, uh, when, I don't know if you can break it down, because one other thing in my introduction, I talked about the fact that the 70% of the 100% uh, of um, um, staff that we have are actually mental health nurses, not actual um, uh, doctors in, in a real term. So is that also a challenge with? So it can be a challenge, but we know that for mental health, we work as a team and it's a multidisciplinary team. You have the psychiatrist, you have the psychologist, you have the occupational therapist, you have counselors, you have uh, you know, psychiatric nurses, like you mentioned, we have pharmacists, and um, we have social workers. All of these people are, import are very important in providing that care pathway for patients. So if, if you say we have psychiatric nurses, it's still a good plus because it means that you have part of that teamwork to be able to provide care for patients. But well, when you now refer to the fact that the other component of that team is not as you know, buoyant or sufficient as we need, yes, then that's a struggle. Um, there are recent reports that show that we have less than 250 psychiatrists in the mm -hmm. country. But you know, that in itself presents another opportunity. While it's a challenge in itself, because... How is it an opportunity? That's so, <laughs> so psychiatrists are the pinnacle of specialty in terms of mental health care. 
And essentially, specialists are supposed to deal with special cases, right? So the conversation now is to shift the messaging or the care approach from waiting for people to be severely ill enough to require a psychiatrist to focus on mental health promotion and prevention of severe illness so that when people present with symptoms early in life or early on, they can benefit from care from a psychologist or from a GP or even from a nurse before they will have the need to see a psychiatrist. Okay. So that increases the whole level of care approach and, and focuses on task shifting, task sharing, engaging community health workers, for example, training them on what they need to know and helping them to help people to recognize symptoms that can start early so they can get intervention before they would need to see a psychiatrist. Do, do you, do you uh, think maybe this is something that's replicated, uh, replicated across Africa or you're speaking from a uniquely Lagos um, kind of um, setup? <laughs> because you have some, we're going to get to the Lagos uh, mental health project, but generally speaking across Africa, this level of this breakdown you've given, is it something that you think is obtainable across board? Because so, one thing that I found mm. in the course of trying to prep for this uh, conversation is that there are places where people don't even know what mental health is about, not to talk of seeking attention care, and right. care. Yeah. So, yes and no. <laughs> and I know it sounds like a political <laughs> response or mm. answer to the question, but yes, because that is the global conversation now. Even in more advanced countries, in quotes, they also suffer a shortage of specialists to be able to provide care. So everybody is beginning to explore how else can we meet the demand by opening up other professionals to be able to provide some level of support okay. and remove that segregation of mental health care from physical health and treat all of them as components of health. Okay. So mm -hmm. in Africa, that conversation is actually a bit more robust than it is happening everywhere else because everywhere else there's still you know the availability of psychiatrists and clinical psychologists and africa recognizes that we have a huge issue on our hands and we don't have the kind of specialist so what can we do it's the same approach that has been you know deployed for hiv for example uh, for tuberculosis where you don't need to see you know specialists or a pulmonologist to be able to treat tb a community health nurse. Yeah, can that's do giving that. um, a credence to the talk around looking for uniquely African solutions, solutions. to our problems. Exactly. Yeah. Using the available resources we have to try and get the most that we can. So in Nigeria, I'm also very familiar that in some parts of the country, up north in the east, there have been several projects by you know renowned professors in Africa who have tried using community health workers to provide uh, mental health interventions in hard to reach areas and th there's is a lot of lessons that have been learned from it so, some very positive ones as to how it will work and some that have shown where the shortcomings can can happen i, I don't need to say it i'm sure um, many person listening will uh, i mean will, will from what you're saying gives the impression that africa is actually moving in the right direction but something happened in 2020 mm. that flipped the switch so to speak for COVID, um, for mental health and that's COVID-19 tell us how it impacted not just I know a lot happened in um, Lagos Nigeria but let's look at it Africa wide how did COVID um, accelerate our attention to mental health so it's a, it's a really great question you asked and I think it's, it was a huge opportunity as well so when COVID happened, you know that there's certain things that were coming across the world. There was the lockdown. Lockdown implied that people couldn't go out to work and get distracted by their physical day-to-day -day activities. It meant people had to be isolated in their homes. Isolation in itself exposes you to yourself. You know, when you're locked in a particular space with people who you haven't spent that much time with, every day, because, I mean, you go to work in the morning, come back in the evening, probably see your loved one for about eight, 12 hours before you go out again, if you don't go out to party somewhere in between, being locked in that space with that person or by yourself exposes you to your thoughts, exposes you to see yourself. It gives you an opportunity of awareness. And I think that was what was critical during the lockdown, awareness. People became a bit more aware of their struggles, became a bit more aware of some of the issues that they've been dealing with. Relationships 
that were very fragile were exposed. And then during that same period, we also had a lot of domestic violence that happened in, in homes because people were locked in that small space. And so the conversations around mental health and mental well-being, you know, started <coughs> to happen. And a lot of people recognized it that before now, when you mention mental health or mental illness, people are thinking very sick people who are on the streets who you know, aren't dressing well or are hearing voices or are seeing things. But then they began to see that, you know, I have been struggling with depression and I didn't realize it. I've been struggling with anxiety, but I didn't realize it. But that quietness, just being allowed by myself, you. allowed me to be aware. And it's one of the critical components that experts will tell you that the first step in providing care for a person is insight. It means the capacity of a person to be aware that they have an issue and that they need help. So insight sprang up and mm -hmm. spread like wildfire. You know, the, 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 before now, there were talks about um, African governments not paying too much attention to mental health. They don't see it as crucial um, if you compare that to the other economic uh, needs. But is there a shift that is being noticed now? I can speak for a few Western African countries that have made that shift nationally, but also sub-regionally. A lot of countries have also started to make that shift. Governments have started to pay more attention to it. I'm um, investing more in infrastructures, in trainings for their, per for their peers or for people, and also creating services for people to be able to get access to counseling. And I think that was also primarily because those who you know, have that responsibility of providing public service were also exposed to you know, mental health struggles. And because of that, they were also able to re realize that this isn't something that is far-fetched or affects other people. It also affects me. And recognizing that it affects you, affects someone that you love, gives you an opportunity to begin to look left and look right and begin to explore what you can do to help those around you. And I, I, I found it very fascinating, primarily because before now, I'm, I'm sure you're probably familiar with um, this renowned celebrity who is a journalist but retired now, uh, Oprah Winfrey, who had mm -hmm you know, started a drive for mental health. And she said, we need to get to that point where mental health is common language. It's something that we can talk about every day and not really feel, you know, feel free. About. Not feel guilty but about there, there was a report mental. that we played before you came into the studio and it still showed that to a large extent, as much as awareness is growing, a lot of people still think there is some uh, voodoo attached to it. There is some hairy, um, hereditary aspect. Can you speak to that quickly before going to break? Right. So that is where the knowledge gap comes up again, right? So there's knowing what it is without being able to label it. And I think labeling it without stigmatizing it. Those are three different things that we need to look at, right? And it's hard to be able to say that we have gotten to where we need to go, but we've definitely, definitely made some progress but there is still a lot more to do. And I think some of the things that have contributed to that current narrative is media, for example. A lot of the movies that we watch would show you people who had done something you know, diabolical and then at the end they confessed and then the next thing they started taking off their clothes and running down the streets. That contributes to the narrative that uh, mental illness or severe mental illness is attributed to voodoo, for example. But I mean, there is scientific data to support hereditary um, cases because there have been people who had parents who had schizophrenia and the children tended to develop that as well. But the narrative has to change and the narrative cannot start with health workers alone. It also starts with the media, it has to start. Where are we dropping the ball people. in this instance? So I, I'll give you a very good example of something that happened a few months ago. Uh, I saw a newspaper report um, about a young man who had tried to end his life by suicide. The way the report was you know, presented was very stigmatizing in itself. It mentioned his name, his home address, his workplace, what he does for a living, what he looks like, how many children and how many wives he had. That wasn't going to help him. That was even going to put him in a worse state than he currently is. So there's, there's well, a lot of work that that's, that, um, that's something. That's one of the first things we learn in journalism try minimize harm but it seems that when we get in we tend to throw it away yes i agree that uh, the media has a role to play uh, here but l let's see what we have more work obviously needs to be done when we come back from this very short break i'll be asking the doctor about the efforts here in lagos nigeria and the possibility of this model being implemented more widely across africa don't go away
Thank you for staying with us. I still have the doctor with me. I'm talking about Dr. Tolu Ajomale. Um, I want to ask you, before we talk about the Lagos project, there's, there's been some concern about underage drinking um, from as young as 13 to um, 18, you yeah. know. And we had the recent case in South Africa where a number of children you know, uh, died. What would be, we know there is a problem, so I wouldn't want us to rehash that. What would be implementable ideas on how we can begin to address the issue of young people? Because there is a connection between mental health and this Substance kind abuse. of behavior. Yeah. Yes. So there, there are two, two, two things there now. There's alcohol abuse and there's substance abuse. And those two are part of a very wide complex network and beyond now we we know that these issues had existed in north america south america and europe for a very long time when we struggled with trying to control it i had a conversation with uh, we had a collaboration with the um, nigerian drug law enforcement agency and one of the reports that they had presented was that africa used to be a transit country for a lot of you know alcohol and substances to other countries so we weren't consumers we were just a transit country for them to shift or move those, those goods to other people who were consumers. Until we got to the point where Africa started becoming a consuming a continent and a lot of nations in Africa started consuming alcohol and substances as well. And then we had people look for local measures to also get, get that high. high that they were looking for. There have been a number of approaches that Several nations have tried. We have, you know, nations have tried using top celebrities or presidents to give a speech and declare a war against, you know, drug abuse. And Nigeria had also done that at some point, war against drug abuse. And it didn't take it away. To be working. No, and I, I'll tell you that it, it won't. It won't work. What would, in your opinion, what would at least begin the process of helping us? First, recognize that we are going to have worse cases. In the next couple of years, it's going to be an epidemic in Africa and in Nigeria as well. But to control it, there are different measures that impact different areas and different people who are responsible for those things. We have those who need to address the supply end. Where is it coming from? We need to block that from coming into the country. And I think some of our enforcement agents have been doing a lot of work in that regard. Um, like the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency have been churning out reports lately of you know, a lot of places that have been stopping billion dollars worth of, you know, substances mm -hmm. that have been coming to the country. That is one end. The other end, and I think we pay too much attention to, is trying to create awareness. But the target of the awareness needs to change. Before now, we talk to the people who are at risk, the children themselves, and say, oh, when you're 14, you're 13, I'm talking to you, don't use drugs, it's not good for you. And some of the problems I've had is, in that messaging, we explain the different ways people get high in trying to educate those children not to do them. But we're actually them. educating them and informing them of things they probably weren't even aware of before. And then, you know, telling the child that, oh, don't mix coke with this because, you know, a lot of people are doing it now. And then the child says, oh, okay, interesting. So that's another way to hide Curiosity. this, right? And because you're in that age period where you're very curious, you would want to try it and just see. There's also peer pressure. You have friends who are doing it because they grew up in certain communities where they're at risk of getting that. So they, they, they tried as well. Okay. So in the, the messaging time, is to what shift. What kind of messaging should we, because if you say don't give them explicit instructions on how they can get high, what kind of messaging should we be looking the at? The messaging would shift to the mm -hmm. gatekeepers. I call them gatekeepers because these are the people who watch over those children, the teachers, the parents. What to look out for when a child is suspicious to be using substances or alcohol. The child suddenly becomes withdrawn, the child suddenly starts, you know, doesn't look at you anymore, becomes shifty, becomes secretive. Those are indications that there is something going on with that child that you need to address. And unfortunately, our continent or our country is also evolving economically and we have both parents who are working, so they're not paying as much attention to their children as they should. That's a whole and level that's of a, conversation. That's a whole <laughs> other conversation. But I mean, it's one of the things that we also need to explore. Children who are in school, teachers also need to begin to get educated as to what to look out for. Some people have uh, included screening measures in schools, random screening to be able to identify people. But then there's another layer. 
If you can't catch them because of, through the gatekeepers, you can't block all the supply, then you must still provide access to rehabilitation for those who become you know, uh, victims of abuse or substance abuse to be able to get them better and then create a support system so they don't go back. Back to it. Okay, time flies when conversation is interesting. Tell us about the mental health project in Lagos, Nigeria. How unique is it? And let's start from there. <laughs> so uh, we had started a lot of work in Lagos. Uh, we, and one of the first things, because it was a government project, was to create the kind of governance structure around it. And one of that was to create a policy for mental health, which we did in 2011. And, that policy you know, created a desk for mental health to coordinate activities around mental health in Lagos. The second thing we did was to recognize the key thrusts of that policy. What are the things we need to focus on so that when we're building projects and building programs, they would address specific things that we're trying to do. The third was to create a legal framework. And so Lagos was the first to create a mental health policy in Nigeria. Um, a current mental health policy in Nigeria. <laughs> and Lagos yeah, the, the one we have is old. Very old. Yeah. Lagos was also the first to create a contemporary mental health law. I know the National has been doing a lot of work to try and get it passed till now, but Lagos is the only one that has a contemporary mental health law that has been enacted. Um, those things now created opportunities for us to create programs. Programs that were targeting different population groups that we felt were at risk. And that included you know, integrating mental health into our general hospitals and primary health facilities because we know that there's still stigma associated with going to specialist facilities. But by doing that, we're encouraging more people to be able to get access to care and people can feel free to walk into any of those, you know, primary health centers or general hospitals, see a psychiatrist and walk out and nobody knows what they went in there for. The other thing we also did was say, okay, create specific programs that target different, you know, population groups. We created a maternal mental health program that we've been implementing in our mother and child centers to be able to address issues around postpartum Post depression, anxiety, and psychosis. We created a school mental health program to create champions in our public schools. We're extending that um, partnership now into private schools to provide resources for them to train you're, counselors. You're, you're, you're in the thick of it, and I know that <laughs> it's quite huge. Um, there's been a lot of commendation for the work that you do. For those that don't know, Lego State is in Nigeria, and what they've been doing with mental health is a unique, uh, some people say it's very unique. So has there been any conversation maybe to expand what you're doing in Lagos to other states? Maybe get localized laws while we are waiting for the national, and then if this can be replicated, and maybe other African countries can take lessons from yes, it. Yes, so we've had some states come to Lagos to do a learning visit to see okay. you know, some of the things that we are doing, and they would share what they are doing and ask for our inputs on how we, they can do it better. So we've had that conversation with some states in the north. We've had a conversation with some states in the southeast. I've had conversations with institutions that I never met in person, that we've only been communicating through telephone or by email to try and provide some guidance for them. We've also had conversations with some Western African countries as well who are also trying to explore how they can create the same kind of you know, approach and traction that we have been doing. But we are not essentially saying that we're getting it all right. What we are saying is there's an opportunity here and we've created the example and a template to show others that it can be done. And then, of course, drive right in on that, hoping to build more and more on that, another scene that we're moving forward. But we are also trying to avoid being the victims of our own success because sometimes when you're doing something very well, other people will leave the states that they're in to come and seek care in your states <laughs> rather than them replicating it what you're you know, where doing. they are. So the, the, the conversation should be around replicating some of the successes here in Lagos and see how it can be adapted to other yes. uh, localities. While what you're doing is great, I, I'm sorry I seem to be rushing because um, we have so much to cover in the short time that we have. Um, are there other um, mental health strategies localize the people who don't have access because when we talk about the kind of help that you give some of it are very um, um, I mean modern those that are in the rural area might not have access so is there maybe other examples of effective and affordable um, care that people can get so we also realize that the 
kind of investment that we require to create infrastructure in every place for mental health was going to be difficult. And so we also decided to leverage on technology and we created a helpline um, that has had a very interesting impact in the kind of work that we do. So this, this helpline, which we call the Lagos Lifeline, was to create an opportunity for people to get access to psychosocial support through trained counselors and services was supposed to be available 24 seven every day of the week. And that has been very interesting for us, both as a project and also as a study, because we wanted to explore how people were going to be able to use that to be able to seek care, how people were going to adapt to it, or how people were going to adopt it, and if it was going to be an acceptable measure. And we found that it was working. We have a few other people who were also doing the same thing in the same space. And we had had the opportunity to be able to expand our interactions with them so that we can have a cross-network you know, collaboration across board. So when people call the service, they have access to people who will speak their local language, who will be able to communicate with them. They can unburden with those counselors. The counselors can provide you know, psychological first aid for them and then make an assessment. And then if they recognize that that person would need further care in a facility, they would help them recognize the closest facility to where they are, public or private, and help and facilitate referral to those places so those people can seek care and then do a follow-up after. So it's a very robust process that we have adopted, but we're also hoping to be able to expand that further to have more languages. What is interesting with that now is that we've had people calling from other states asking for help in Lagos, not realizing it was a Lagos service. <laughs> uh, you know, there were people calling from Cross River, people calling from Enugu, calling from uh, Borno State. And now we've had to go further by looking for resources in those states, create an introduction between about what we do, and create a partnership with them so that when we get people in those states, we know where to send them to. Investment is key here. Investment in infrastructure, in personnel, and all of that. Um, across Africa, what would you say would be priority when we talk about investing in mental health? Maybe one or two, we have less than three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, investing more in human resource development, that doesn't necessarily mean get more specialists, but you know, train more people to be able to do what they can. And they don't necessarily have to be medical experts, right? That is one. Leverage on technology, I think that's a huge opportunity, especially with young people, to be able to engage with them and be able to provide access to care for them. And then three, exploring the use of health insurance as a way of providing access to care so people yeah, don't have to pay out of pocket. I was actually going to ask about that, about time is not <laughs> over, but go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, so I think, you know, the, in the context of universal health coverage, health insurance also provides an opportunity for people to be able to access services without paying out of pocket. But sometimes these services can be quite expensive. It's not all gloom. So what, <laughs> what, do you envisage a time when mental health will be made a priority in Africa? How soon do you see that happening? In 30 seconds, if you can. Yes, I think we will get there, but I think it is a very long and you know, difficult road that we have to go through. But once the demand becomes more recognizable, I think a lot of priority will be placed on the kinds of resources that are required. And we have been getting a lot of you know, non-local people who are bringing in investments for mental health in Africa as well. Dr. Zulu, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. All right, let me wrap up by saying, based off our conversation, it is obvious that without necessary actions from every stakeholder involved in delivering mental health services in Africa, mental health illness will become a health emergency. Commitment and investment are key words here. Until I see you next time, please do take good care of yourself. You can only help others if you do so. Adios. Thank you.